You are listening to Fanfa Tracks. Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. Star Wars news in a single file. This is Making Tracks. Here are your hosts, Mark Newbold and Mark Bolcaster. That's not true. That's impossible. Greetings, one and all, and welcome to Reaction Chat for episode 8 of Star Wars Andor, brought to you by those freedom fighters at fanfordrags.com. So, to recap, last week we saw Andor return home to Ferrix, where he paid off his debts using his payment from the Aldani heist and tried to convince Marva to leave with him, but she was determined to stay and start her own rebellion. On Coruscant, the Imperial Security Bureau met to discuss how to implement the Public Order and Resentencing Directive, PORD, for short, Palpatine's new initiative to crack down on the numerous rebellious acts that have sprung up across the galaxy, whilst Momothma and Luthen have a heated discussion about the fundamental morals of a rebellion and his role in the Aldani heist. Luthen sends his aide to meet with Vel, where she is ordered to type any loose ends after the heist and to kill Andor, since he knows too much about Luthen and could implicate him if he's ever caught. At one of her numerous parties, Momothma reconnects with her longtime friend Tay Koma and asks him to use his position as a banker to help her access her family fortune and redirect it towards supporting her fight against the Emperor. And on the sunny beach planet of Kiermos, Cassian, under the name of Keith Grigo, is once again in the wrong place at the wrong time and is stopped by an Imperial shore trooper and accused of being involved in something he generally knows nothing about and is sentenced to six years in an Imperial prison. Episode 8 picks up as Cassian is loaded onto a transport heading for Nikana 5, an Imperial prison planet which is run a little differently from what you might expect. The eighth episode of this first season has the longest runtime so far, and to give me his thoughts and reactions, I'm joined, as always, by our main man from the Midlands, Mark Newbold. So, Mark, what's your initial thoughts after seeing this episode for the first time? If you are enjoying Andor so far, you will really enjoy this episode. And if Andor not floating your boat, I can't see anything changing your opinion (laughs) in episode eight, not again or five, because it is very much more of the same but if, if this is a sumptuous meal, then get the steak knives out because there's plenty to tuck into on this one. Yeah, again, it's like that um, juicy kind of subtext that I think everybody, at least, who is enjoying this, and I think a lot of the, the web outlets are, seem to be getting their teeth into, I think that is where this show kind of shines. But as um, somebody has said to me last weekend, actually, this is Star Wars and I want to see stars and I want to see wars and it kind of doesn't feel like we're seeing much of either at the moment. But the one thing that I'm really excited for is by the time Celebration Europe rolls around, I am hoping that Hasbro will finally announce that the next HasLab project is going to be the Mon Mothma dinner party set because I think that, <laughs> the whole dinner party play set, will be amazing. Yes, I, I, well, you know, I can't argue with that logic. If it comes with the actual food, even better. But yeah, I, I would love to see a dinner party set. There's been so much in this, I think, you know, because we've seen Coruscant, we're seeing a lot of different places and we're certainly getting around the galaxy. And and your friend that made the point about, I want to see stars, I want to see wars, that's a fair point. But if you know anything of your Star Wars history, you know that we are prior to that first major attack. You'll see places get levelled. You'll see places get subjugated. You'll see rebel insurgency, rebel with a small r, insurgency moments like Aldani. But you're not going to see a Death Star battle. You're not going to see major military engagements. That's not what's happening at this point in the galaxy, or certainly in and around where these people are dealing. There's probably stuff happening on the left-hand side of the map that no one's got charted out yet. There's all sorts of stuff happening out there we don't even know about because, you know, it's not all marked down. But the point is, for what we're looking at, that's not what's at play. And I think what we are getting is the underpinning to the moment where the rebels can make their move, or as we we saw with Luthen, kind of making the move happen. You know, there's a lot of impatience now. We're seeing Mothma, for example, ready to do what's required, but on her clock, on her terms. And there's Luthen, who's clearly been ploughing away at this for a long time, is of a mind of, it's got to happen. Cassian, who's street-level guy at this point, is looking at the Empire going, you walk in, sell their food, whatever. They're not paying any attention. They don't care. They're so complacent and comfortable in their power that they're not even paying that much attention to us. We don't matter. And so there's all these different thought processes 
you know, we've had uh, Saul Guerrero come into play. And so there's this different people of different opinions in different places trying to make it work. I think it's fascinating. We kick off the episode with uh, Andor being loaded onto his transport. And, you know, again, he's kind of using that that Keith Grigo kind of pseudonym, which, you know, to be honest, I still find it quite funny that it's really easy to hide in the Star Wars galaxy. All you need to do is just give somebody a false name, you know, as, yeah. which is quite it's quite <laughs> interesting how like you just, you just do that and they don't seem to check anything else, which uh, one thing that actually um, I did wonder is it's like we're 10 years past where uh, we see the Bad Batch. So you kind of start to wonder how successful the whole Imperial chain code project yeah. was, for one. Because that is something that, again, it hasn't been mentioned. And it, it might just be one of those things that hasn't come into the, the sphere of the um, you know the writer's remit as such. I suppose in some respects it kind of also makes it a little bit restrictive, but it would make it quite interesting and would tie it into like the Bad Batch. So he gets loaded onto this transport heading to Nakana 5. And the one thing for me anyway, personally, whenever you stick a number in front of a planet name in Star Wars, I just immediately think... That just feels a little bit more like Star Trek. It's just odd. There is definitely something of that. I suppose the Avenue 4, which is a moon, but I take your point. It is it is one of those sci-fi kind of things. I mean, the Kena 5, it was an interesting location visually. Yeah. Do you remember uh, Captain America Civil War with the prison? Yes. In the, in the ocean. They had that vibe about it, beautifully designed, uh, being out there with all those sort of whirlpools, those turbines, you know, obviously it's all water-powered and stuff. So that was fascinating, but there's little doubt that they're not headed somewhere nice. And you're not going back to that sort of Blackpool Beach pleasure planet he's just been arrested on, are they, sir? So. No, which is a shame because I was hoping we'd see a little bit more of that. But then, you know, cast mind back to the Fan for Tracks articles that you guys wrote and the coverage, you know, it was pretty much what we saw last week probably would have been the coverage that they shot. But yeah, I mean, I suppose in some respects, that again, it's it gives him that kind of just position. And also he's literally just gone out to get some milk and he gets arrested for doing nothing, for just being, in, you know, a person in the wrong kind of place at the wrong time. Time. Yeah, the prison planet itself, I, I really liked the whole kind of concept of it. The squid game is a bit, yeah. in its essence, you know, the whole kind of like the fact that you've got seven levels and, you know, the seven rooms in each level and, you know, everyone competing against each other purely not, you know, to survive, but just purely just so you get some flavour in your food, which is quite, quite interesting. But it was the literal embodiment of cogs in the machine because... That was the thing that basically it looked like Andor was doing. You know, they were basically making these giant cogs. God knows what for. You could imagine at this point in time, it could be some kind of machinery which would be needed for Death Star, for we know. But the aesthetic was interesting. It kind of did, but it also didn't feel very Star Wars-y because even with the Empire, you still feel like it was a little bit too clinical and a little bit too crisp and clean. And I just felt like it just needed a little bit more of a like lived-in universe feel. Almost as if the officers and the guards and that first landing area should be the, the pristine thing. But actually, if the guards are going to leave them to their own devices, then yeah, they should, you know, it should be a little bit more rough and ready, a little bit more gritty. So that didn't necessarily work for me, but I like the whole idea and I like this notion that we meet Melchie as well, you know, one of his compatriots who then goes on the, the Scarif raid. Are we going to see him for the rest of the season? You know, are they going to break out together and oh, is he going to return in season two? Because uh, again, you know, they all need to get recruited by the Rebel Alliance at some point so they end up on Scarif. It was good to see Melchie for sure, definitely. And I mean, that's another point that the fact that Cassian is already part of the command structure in Rogue One. Yeah. And that Jin is the outsider, you know, and then uh, Chirrut and Baze, they kind of come into it. But K2 is already a droid under the auspices of the Rebellion and Cassian's a captain. And, you know, there's characters that are already in there and doing their thing. And you do wonder when he puts that Scarif team together, who does he pick? Or rather, who puts their hand up to say, well, I'm coming. It's Han, Luke and Leia in the briefing room in Jedi. We'll count me in. They're straight there to go, yep, we're with you, Cassian. It's not just Jin's words that make them do it. It's Jin's words convincing Cassian that this is a cause we need to get behind. And I think in Andor, we're seeing the start of the impatience. We've got to start making them pay. We need to start getting some victories and making it happen. And that it's not going to be all heroic Che Guevara poster boy heroic looking yeah. cool moments mm. actually nasty gritty real world we've got to be almost as bad as the bad guys to do the right thing and be damned our souls it's just what we've got to do and I think people like Cassian who's who's lived a life and, and now he's on like in a five and as we see in this episode going through some real crappy stuff and seeing really crappy stuff all it does is tempers the steel of his conviction to do 
what he's going to do, even though we know he's not at that point yet to do it. Maybe Melchi is. We don't know Melchi's background yet. Hopefully we'll find out a bit more about that. But you, you can see the start of these characters bonding, can't you? Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing, you know, they're working in a very close kind of environment day in, day out, and they're, so they're going to be talking. You even start to see, or at least kind of like they're foreshadowing that potentially there is some kind of underworld communications going on. Where, you know, there was a guy that looked like he was signing or something to another guy in another part of the prison and that was so mm. queuing up. Is that how they then use that way to kind of like form a revolt and make an escape? Hi, this is John Morton from The Empire Strikes Back, and you're listening to Bantha Tracks. Kino Loy, played by Andy Serkis. So he's like kind of like you could say the pit boss. He seems to be the guy running Cassian's kind of room. He certainly ain't taking any crap from anybody. And he's the one who's really trying to push everything through. And, you know, he says, like, I've only got like 249 days left of the sentence, which, again, could be a little bit foreshadowing, but gets down to one day and he gets like shot in the head or something. What's your thoughts about actually having Andy Serkis, who played Supreme Leader Snoke in The Force Awakens and Last Jedi, have a voice off? Did that jar you? Did it pull you out of the, the episode? Or did you just kind of accept the character and, and moved on? I think as a British viewer... There's been a lot of familiar faces in this show all the way through yeah. it. They've used a lot of, of well-known British faces. It's not names that you could go, that's John Smith, that's Jane Jones. It, it's, that's that bloke from Whatnot, that's that fella from So-and-So. But bringing in Andy Serkis... He's a great actor. He's a director. I know that the Imaginarium have been working on a lot of different stuff. They worked on She-Hulk. So Circus is very in with the Disney sort of circle. Uh, there's a connection there. He clearly loves Star Wars. I appreciated it because I didn't know it was going to happen. I had no idea yeah. Andy Circus was in this. So that was a treat. And he's always good to watch. We know what a genius he is with Gollum and all the stuff that he did there and Planet of the Apes and the technical stuff. And we know that that guy should be walking around with a the shelf full of Oscars that he's more than deserved. So he's a legend in that sense. Also, it's a tangible connection to other Star Wars, not in a distracting way because we heard Andy Serkis, but we never saw Andy mm -hmm. Serkis in, in the role of Snoke. But it's not distracting in that sense. He's, he's a very recognisable guy. So there's that moment of, oh, cool, Andy Serkis. I didn't know he was in this. That's a big name to have slipped through the net. But beyond that, I think once you get into it and you realise that Kino is he's the shop floor union guy almost, but he's not because he's controlling them to the degree that, for example, if any of those guys are sleepwalkers, they're screwed because they're walking on that shop on that floor when the red lights on and they're fried. Yeah, you know he's keeping them in line. He's he's put your hands behind your head, stand still. He's given all the instructions. I mean, he's not. You see his quarters and they're just the same as everybody else, you know? They've picked him to be the shop union guy. He's the guy that's going to keep them in line. Don't let me down because the table that gets the lowest score gets fried. You know, it's all work by fear. Just makes you wonder what he's going to get out of it when those 249 days are up. Yeah, precisely. Nobody, at least from what we've seen, has been other than Andor seems falsely imprisoned and, you know, it wasn't me, I'm innocent. It would be interesting yeah. to see, like, actually who this guy is and that, just to build out that bit of background to him. It's about those kind of levels of grey and there's levels of moral ambiguity and it's the people that Andor's working with. Are they killers? Yeah. And have they killed for more kind of selfish reasons or is it are they all in kind of like similar positions of like low level yeah. you know i don't know one was nicked for stealing bread or something like that you know so it'd be interesting to see those kind of environments like we see in kind of like shawshank redemption stuff like that it's kind of where you forge those really strong relationships and bonds mm. about which carry on once you are out from prison now on the flip side and obviously in in contrast as and or is very good at doing we yeah. kind of jump back to coruscant and we see that our dear friend Cyril Khan has also been a bit of a naughty boy because he's been filing false reports to try and flag Andor and find a location for Andor using his data centre's information network, which, of course, then gets the attention of the ISB and he's brought before Deidre Miro. So I think we had said pretty early on in the season that, you know, you're going to expect that these two are going to end up working with each other. But it's quite interesting how, like, she doesn't really take what he says as being that important just yet, suddenly realises that actually, you know, there's been a bit of a cover-up on Ferex, gets him to read the report and stuff like that. So, yeah, how was that whole interaction? Did that go the way that you thought it was going to go when these two finally meet? I think a lot of people would be the same. Just assume that they're, they're going to cross paths. They're going to be on the same page. They both want the same thing, ultimately. They want and or court. They're both all about order and rule, you know, the way that things should be run. But when you drill down into it a little bit, and I don't just think it's because she's a woman, I just think as a character, 
taking the gender out of it, just as a character. She's had a tough time getting to the level she's at. She's had to struggle and has finally got the attention of the major. It's given her the credit she's probably, more than probably, has definitely earned because she is starting to pull all these things together. And week by week, you're seeing different elements of the jigsaw puzzle. We can see it because we've got the overview, but they can't see it. So when her and Cyril meet, I think you'd be forgiven like we probably did, thinking, oh, that's it then. That, that, that's the two key characters. That's Holmes and Watson together now. They're, they're going to be right on Cassian's tail. But it wasn't that case at all. She's suspicious of everyone, and she wants the credit herself. She's probably getting a little bit, not power hungry, but why should she share the credit with somebody else? And also, at this point, even she, who we know is the one that's kind of picking up on a lot of interesting points, even she's not quite seeing the level that Cyril's at, seeing what he's seeing. So at the moment, he's just another person to not interrogate, but question. It's an interesting non-starter. I think as, I think a lot of people assumed as soon as they met, it would be bing, and we're off to the races. But actually, that wasn't the case. I don't know if it's just that slightly optimistic hope that I have, but I'm just still not 100% sure that Di De Miro isn't some deep rebel plant. I just kind of have that, and I think that the true hardened Empire stal- stalwart is Cyril Khan. Just a nagging feeling I get in the back of my mind. I mean, they've not really foreshadowed it too much, and, and I think it might just be the whole notion of like being the underdog a little bit and you know being the new officer as well who's keen to kind of like make her stamp, making me be slightly yeah. more, I don't know, give her a little bit of extra sympathy. But then the Empire at this point is so seems so detached from the actual day-to-day lives of people because we're not really seeing massive amounts of like, you know, stormtroopers running through towns and cities and kind of like laying waste to everything, you know, but we hear about so much from the Rebel Alliance. It's hard to feel that because we're hearing about what's happening from the Rebel Alliance perspective. And as we know with everything, it's always a little bit subjective and we take everything as very much, you know, whatever Mom Mothma and the Rebels are saying it's being the true version of events when potentially it may not be. And it could be mm. their subjective spin on things. Propaganda on both sides, you mean? Ex- pretty much. And like, you know, you talk, you know, that conversation between Lufin and um, Saul Guerrero, which I think was one of the, you know, the most interesting and, and well written scenes that we've had in this series. And that's saying a lot because we've had some really cracking bits of conversation, which we don't tend to get so much in Star Wars. Both of them who are kind of like seeing their rebellion from their perspective and trying to justify it to one another. I think that's where this is really starting to come to the front because you've got Cyril, who's almost got an idealistic idea of what the Empire should be. You know, he's like looking at the insignia in the morning on on his poster on the wall, like, that's what I aspire to. And then there's Dead Ramiro, who's actually in the trenches, dealing with all the backstabbing, trying to get impressed, trying to get noticed, to essentially do the same thing. And then you look at the Saw Guerrero scene with Luthan, and they both want the same thing but come at it from very different points of view. And it also showed the conversation there. Saw has no interest dealing with, doesn't want to have any involvement with. It's called Anto Krieger, but they all want the same thing. And it's like you say, there's been some great scripted, confrontational moments between characters and clever moments where they're saying one thing but meaning another. You don't necessarily expect that from Star Wars. This is not wooden dialogue. So we've got this great characters and situations thing that Lucas has left us as a backdrop to tell these stories with increasing complexity, a bit more gritty, a bit more involved. You're kind of reading between the lines. It's if you give it a bit of thought, it all makes sense. For everything in one location, daily news, reviews, interviews, podcasts, video and social media feeds, bookmark fanthatracks.com for Star Wars News 24-7, 365. We're now starting to have multiple storylines all kind of running on concurrently. We've got Andor's, and then we've got what's happening between Mon Mothma and Lufin and Mon Mothma and the rest of the Senate. But we're still sat on Ferrix, and, you know, we're seeing what's actually happened since Andor's left, Bix and, and Marvin. And obviously, Bix gets arrested in this episode at the very end. You know, this whole episode just feels, again, it's like one of those ones where the tension, everything is just 
just slowly being tightened. Mm. It's like Luthan said in the previous episode, really, about how, like, you know, the Empire's sl- slowly choking us, but yet we've grown so used to it that we're not aware that's happening. And I just wonder if that's happening also in the way this story is playing out. And this is why people kind of say, oh, not lots happened in this episode, because actually it's more subtle than I think we give Star Wars credit for. So therefore, you're looking for the big explosions. Like the Empire, you're looking for the heists, you're looking for the big rebel activity, but actually it's a yeah. subtle stuff going on under the surface which is creating the tension which is making this show so much more engaging to watch and i really can't wait to have like a spare weekend when i can just binge the whole thing and just see how it all plays out concurrently in a binge kind of way it's interesting isn't it you know um just how like bix gets captured she's going to probably end up in prison whether or not she ends up in the same one as and or i mean that would be a little bit too convenient and i don't necessarily think that's going to happen but you know we see her getting tortured by De Jamiro, which again, in a way, is reminiscent to what we see um, Han go through, but also the way the shot ends is kind of a bit like Princess Leia's interrogation in A New Hope. We're focusing on a burgeoning resistance on a single planet sooner or later, and it might just be because of the, um, the treatment that Bix goes through. We're going to see the catalyst that is going to see an uprising sooner rather than later. They're telling big stories, galactic stories, important people stories people at the top end of the rebellion stories. And yet, in the same way that, you know, you're dealing with Luke and the Emperor and Vader, but the thing that draws Luke to Dagobah is the panic that his friends are going to be hurt because of the vision he has on Dagobah. The hook that's going to catch Andor out, it's Marva being ill because his mother's not well. Yeah. And Bix is, is rallying around and Brasso's rallying around. You learn that Marva is... is I think they're called the Daughters of Ferrix. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's almost like a community thing is the way it read to me that she's kind of important to that town and it's not necessarily blood relationships, but people as family, you know, choose your own family kind of thing, which is kind of a Star Wars thing anyway. Ray is just as entitled to call herself Skywalker as anybody else kind of logic. And so that feels like because of Cassian's obvious love for his mom, that's going to draw him out. If he knows that she's ill, she's going to become a pawn in, in the broader picture because he's become the linchpin now to, finding the character they keep referring to as Axis, which we assume is Luthan yeah. at this juncture. It might be somebody else, but we assume it's Luthan. That's, you know, I'm quite happy to be to be wrong on that because you don't want to assume too many things. But like you said, there's all these threats going on. There's the Deidre and Cyril relationship, inverted commas relationship, that's building. There's Vel and Sinter who are now both on Ferrix. Vel, we've already seen in different locations. We saw her on Aldani in the mud and the grind. Then we see her on Coruscant, well dressed and you know, not scrabbling around in a poncho on in the Highlands kind of thing. So is that her cover? Is that what she really is? There's more to Vel, I think, than we've seen. Sinter is in situ on Ferrix. She's seeing these things go on. So there's all these different relationships. And then, as I say, we're skipping around, but we get to Luthan and Saw Guerrera all the different cogs in a watch, isn't it? They've got to spin in the right speed and the right motion to make the timing work properly. It just feels like such a clever show. We're watching it happen. We don't know what time it is yet, but you know that when it gets there, it's going to be absolutely spot on. Last week we saw Val was given the mission to go and basically um, whack and or, and then we see mm. her and Sintra. What I found really interesting about the conversation that they had whilst they're uh, scoping out uh, Ferrix, Matt, is that whilst we're kind of almost led to believe that it's Val who's motivated one for the Aldani raid and, you know, she's one who's almost in charge. You know, it's it's Sintra who's, this is the rebellion over everything else. And so you kind of see that slightly different side of her. It gives us, like, pause to think about actually how people's motivations are presented. And it kind of goes back a little bit to, like, you know, the Saul Guerrero conversation and stuff. And, you know, with Luthan actually just charging Saul Guerrero for you know, for ship parts and stuff, ultimately kind of saying, well, look, you know, I know you're we're working on the same page, but basically you're going to fund my own operations because you've got your own agendas. And also, I think for me anyway, I mean, yes, I think you could probably start to get a rough idea of what's going to happen in this show in terms of like, we know Andrew's going to escape at some point. How he does that is obviously the point that's going to be interesting. But I still don't really have a huge idea in terms of speculation as to where these characters are going to end up. If it is Luthan who is Access or if it's that other chap, you know, you've got Fulcran, 
and you've got access and that, you know, again, it's all, all around pivoting. It's all around pivoting around and, and changing the balance of, of power in the galaxy. So I thought that was a nice, clever kind of touch there to kind of like allude to that uh, code name. Hi, this is Gareth Edwards, director of the best standalone Star Wars film since Caravan of Courage called Rogue One. You're listening to Panther Tracks. Enjoy. We're rolling into episode nine this week. Based on what we've seen so far, is this going to be another episode where we're going to have more tension build or we do you think it's you know we're going to get another episode with, with Andor firmly in this prison or do you think is he going to escape it in this episode is this whether plans get made and then we see him like escape in episode 10 Lucasfilm have said they want to get away from trilogies and keep gravitating back to trilogies and these seasons the two seasons are pretty much broke into trilogies and we're in approaching the middle of another one so it does feel like you'll have a, a sort of a pattern. But I think from what we've seen of Andor, no one episode has especially stood out from any other for being particularly more action-packed or particularly more dramatic. It can't all just be Crash Bang Wallet because Star Wars would wither on the vine if it was just that all the time, which is, is a frustration to see people's reactions to this show being slow and boring. It's like, are you watching the same thing? Yeah. There's so much, so much going on. And if you consider where it's aiming its, its lasers at, Two films in a lot of people's top five all-time Star Wars things, A New Hope and Rogue One. That's where we're aiming for. That's the target point because everything launches after those. And I consider those two things very much a partnership of films. I think of Rogue One and A New Hope closer now than I think of Star Wars and Empire. But because of all of that, I think I think more of the same. I don't think that there's going to be any great, big, huge break-the-wheel moments uh, one thing I'd noticed a few reviews this week of this episode sort of saying about how Cassian had been beaten and in, almost beaten into submission in this cycle of work he was doing in the prison. I didn't see it like that at no. all. I, I thought he was playing the game. He was biding his time. He's, I mean, on the face of it, he's not a patient man. Clearly, he is a patient man because he's not looking for the, the quick out. He's playing the long game in this scenario. He, he saw their location when they came in to this prison planet. So he knows the lay of the land to a degree, scoping people out because Cassian is, and I know you appreciate this, he is kind of like the Star Wars James Bond. He's, he's, he's the blunt instrument that can be put into a situation. We're watching him hone those skills. He's picking up things from other people around him. He's just getting into the rhythm of it. He doesn't want to stand out. He doesn't want to be the problem prisoner because they'll just they could stick him in isolation. Yeah. He's watching people get electrocuted on metal floors. They could just kill him. There's no requirement for them to keep him alive if he keeps making himself an obvious nuisance so i think he's playing the game i don't see him as browbeaten i see him as just playing the long game waiting for the moment he's looking at the shift rotations he's seeing how many guards are around he's, he's seeing what his fellow prisoners are about and what their kind of vibe is and who he thinks might back him up when the moment comes or i think episode Nine will be more of that. That's how it reads to me. But as for Mothma and Saw Guerrera and Luthan, it's the tightening of the screw. It's the ratcheting up of the tension. It's more of that, more of that, more of that, because we are now in the sort of the last third of the season, the yeah, last quarter of the season mm. already, which is crazy. So you kind of know that once we get past episode 10, they've sort of said 11 and 12 are like two-part finale almost. I, I think if you're going to see big stuff then, that's when you'll see it. That's when you might see you know, a three-quarter completed Death Star, looking a bit like the Death Star in Return of the Jedi. You know what I mean? That's when you'll see these things. I don't know. I mean, that's a point, actually, saying that out loud. I don't know when they actually physically started building the second Death Star. I think that had been under operation for quite a long time. So there's all all sorts of stuff we could see. They want to underpin the relationships because season two feels to me like it's going to be moving a lot faster. You know, a lot of things are going to be happening a lot quicker because we're racing towards the big decision at Scarif. You raised a couple of interesting points there. And actually, one, you talk about the pacing. And that's sometimes a thing, isn't it? Too much dessert and you want some meat and potatoes. Now, this this show is meat and potatoes with, you know, just a little bit of apple sauce on the side. Let's be fair. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. And I wonder, cinematic visuals aside, like CG quality and all that stuff, I wonder if we're going to look back in 10, 15 years' time and be talking still heavily about Andor as opposed to something like The Mandalorian, which is very much, you know, action every single episode. It's kind of like a slightly different genre of film. It's going to be hard to compare you know apples to apples as such however it's set in the same universe in the same galaxy so therefore you know you will compare it and i, I just think this could be 
Vishova could launch a whole new different era and a different style of Star Wars storytelling that we're not accustomed to. But you are right, because I think the putting the groundwork in and the foundation for season two, I think that is the thing we're doing. They're building for season two, because as you said, you know, if it's three episodes per year leading you up to the Rogue One storylines, every episode needs to find an interesting way of being able to kind of explain the exposition of like, you know, we're a year later and this has happened. Having these core foundational characters develop a relationship in this first season is only then going to pay off in season two, where you can kind of mm. start to really tighten everything up and kind of start to make those kind of really emotional moments kind of sing deaths and battles and sacrifices. You know, I mean, I still think we're going to see deaths and battles and sacrifices at the end of this season, but the longer that we're with these characters means that it's going to hurt more when we do see those in season two. Totally agree. This show is working hard to make you give a crap about characters that aren't going to make it. I don't think Bix or Marva or Brasso or Cyril Khan or Deidre Miro, I don't think any of them are getting out of this show. I think very, very few people are coming out the back end of this show. We've not met Tivik yet. You know, we've not met a lot Anton Merrick yet. Yeah. We've not met General Draven yet. We've not seen Dodonna yet. We know where Dodonna goes. But there's certain characters that we've not met yet that you know we're going to. You know, we see two tubes in this one. We've seen Saw Gerrera in this one. They're on. They're not on Jeddah, so maybe we'll see them go to Jeddah in season two. There's lots of things, interesting, meaty things that we can hypothesize we're going to see. But I do think that a lot of this is making you ready for losing certain characters. But more than that, with people like, for example, Mon Mothma, and especially Saw Gerrera, which I think we'll see a lot more of, yeah, I think you'll see why Saw Gerrera looks more like Darth Vader in Rogue One yeah, than he does absolutely. in this mm. at some junction, some skirmish, some battle, some reason why he gets injured. And Mothma, why she's slightly more detached and stand apart from things because you can assume that she's got losses ahead of her. Or given that Perrin seems to be a bit of a, I don't know quite the right words he is, but not the most loyal guy, she's probably got betrayal to deal with in her future. I think so. You know, season one of Andor seems to have taken us from five years before A New Hope and he's going to take us up to four years before. So each of those four, three episode clumps of episodes in season two will go year four to year three, three to two, two to one, one to right up to the bumper of Rogue One when we finish Andor, which will be fascinating. And I'm in no rush to get there because I'm loving it. This show, more than pretty much anything else that we've had in the Disney era, will be the one in 10, 15 years' time. Like we do now with Revenge of the Sith, look back at Sith and think about all the stuff that went on in that and how satisfying that film was. And it's still a film that you think of fondly and look back at and go, wow, that was a three-course meal of a film. But Andor will be, because of the content we're chewing through slowly right now, it'll be exactly the same. You'll just look back and go, wow, how much did we learn in that show? And of course, as everybody knows, I'm sure they're all thinking the same thing as Mark was talking right then. It's exactly how we're starting to feel about The Last Jedi as well. Thanks for listening to Making Tracks. If you want to be a part of the action and stay updated on all the latest Star Wars news, visit fanthatracks.com or check out the free Fanthatracks app through the App Store to follow us on your mobile device. You can reach out to us and send in your listeners' questions by emailing radio at fanthatracks.com. Comment, like and share on any of our social media feeds at Fanthatracks. And be sure to subscribe, leave a review, preferably a five-star one, on Amazon Music, Audible, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcast or smart speaker of choice. And as always, thanks to James Semple for composing the Fanthatracks intro, Adam O'Brien for making tracks out with music and Mark Daniel and Vanessa Marshall for our voiceovers remember tune in to Good Morning Tatooine it's live Sunday evenings at 9 o'clock UK 4pm Eastern 1pm Pacific on Facebook and YouTube and check out our Fantasy Tracks Radio Friday Night Rotation every Friday night at 7pm UK time for new episodes of the Phantom From Down Under Planet Layer Desert Planet Discs Start Your Engines Collecting Tracks Cannon Fodder and special episodes of Making Tracks and that's me done for this episode so thank you very much for uh, listening and joining us this week we will be back for another episode of Reaction Chats next week stay safe take care may the force be with you coming up next on Fanta Tracks Radio it's another episode of Making Tracks